Shavua Tov. Welcome back. If everyone, if I could ask everyone, which seems to be a uh, standard standard announcement today, but in the light of God letting us know that the only time you feel your pulse is when you shut your cell phones off on Shabbos, if everyone could please feel their pulses once again here tonight, and please close your cell phones not to disturb the program. It's an honor and pleasure to have spent Shabbos with Aish rabbis, Aish branch heads, Aish alumni, board of directors of Aish Torah, who came here to enjoy this amazing Shabbos together with us this Shabbos. Thank you all for coming. I feel it's appropriate to mention someone who has been so involved in Aish Torah and has dedicated so much time, but unfortunately was not able to be here for this Shabbos, and that's Mr. Jake Aronov. Thank you, Jake. Also, over Shabbos, I got to meet so many of you, but I want to specifically mention all the, some of the branches who have come here together with their lay leaders. I want to mention that Rabbi Elliot Mathias and his branch heads who have come, who have come together, a group of over 120 students. I want to thank Mr. Aaron Wolfson, who is a real partner and a dear friend of Aisha Torah and a pillar of Campus Kirov in North America and around the world. Aish Detroit joined us this Shabbos with Rabbi Simcha Tolwin and his wife and family, together with the Liptons and Klein families. Aish Washington, the Cones, Katz, and Ratner families, together with the Bucksbounds and the Bars. From Aish St. Louis, Rabbi Yosef and Mrs. Mimi David were here. The, the Jacobs, Shervitz, and, and I know the Zephyr families were not able to make it, but all of you, it's been amazing to be here. Shabbos together with you. A special note, and so many of you have got to meet them on, this, on the other side of the ocean, when you've come with your groups and with your trips and your missions to Israel, the operations team of Aisha Torah Israel are here, Bradley Martin, Avigdor Elk, Kobe Weinbaum, and Mati Gaffney are here. They're, they're servicing you on the other side of the ocean. They got to spend Shabbos together with us as well. However, most importantly, and most amazingly, it was really a pleasure to spend Shabbos with every single one of you, friends of Aisha Torah from around the world who made this such a special conference. Thank you all. And with that, with the packed house here on Matzah Shabbos on the Saturday night here in Stanford, Connecticut, I want to welcome you all to the 18th annual Matzah Shabbos Saturday night program the 18th Annual Asia Torah Partners Conference. Whoever I meet around the world, I can always just say to them, come to Jerusalem, get a hotel room, move in with, get roommates, I don't care what you do, and get your body into this building. First of all, it's a world center right across from the Kotel. We have the location, the inspiration's in the air, it's Jerusalem. People walk in and they're engaging in conversation right away, like, what is this place? It's a place people learn about Judaism. And they start looking at the Chihuly piece and they start looking at the people going through and it's a happening building. And people feel comfortable in a place like this. They want to know what exactly is happening here. No matter what your background is, it, it, it really, it's meaningless. You can learn Torah, you can learn wisdom, you can be a passionate Jew, you can really embrace your heritage. That is what I love about Isha Torah, that we are there. We are literally the ambassadors, the entire Jewish people, sitting in the heart of the Jewish world in the eternal capital of Jerusalem. The students come here exploring uh, with a very genuine, sincere desire to learn about Judaism, learn about our heritage. It's really interesting because it's a big enough building that we can really house many programs at the same time. Women's programs, religious men's programs, secular college student programs, uh, Russian immigrants, Israeli soldiers.
and they're all Jews, and they're all in the building for one thing. We want to deepen our connection to Judaism. Essentials course is, it's from black hats to body piercings. It's from 18 to 80. Anyone can come, it's free. Like you can just come and experience it. I'm convinced anyone who comes in for the three week Essentials program will leave a different person. The Essentials program was really the first time that I'd done any Jewish learning. And for, it just it totally opened my mind. I've never seen a day in Essentials where somebody didn't come out saying wow from some idea, some class, some teacher, some discussion that came out of the Essentials program. Anyone who steps into this building is going to be intrigued and riveted by the experience that they'll have here. And that's the gift that Ishtar is giving the world through this building. Many of you here have already been to our Aish World Center in Jerusalem and have experienced a little bit. And those who haven't, you got a little bit of a taste over here. But through the many programs and trips that Aisha Torah offers throughout the year, it's our pleasure to welcome you and to invite you all to come experience more of this weekend by coming to study in Aisha Torah for a day, for a week, for a month, for a year, for life. On that note, the epicenter of Aisha Torah around the world not only Jerusalem, but it's in our yeshiva. It's in the Eishat Torah yeshiva where our students and all you branch heads and all the Eish rabbis around the world and many of you campus students who have yet to experience come to study, to learn not only how to learn Torah and learn more and more of it, but how to become Jewish leaders around the world. And so with Eishat Torah, being, Eishat Torah yeshiva being the epicenter of that, it's my pleasure to introduce to you a little taste of the Eishat Torah Yeshiva under, under directorship of Rabbi David Rossman, who spent Shabbos together with us here. Ladies and gentlemen, the Eishat Torah Yeshiva. <laughs> So after I graduated from college, I decided that I wanted to pursue surfing professionally. And I was going to be in Europe competing in some surf contests. And I had two months that I wasn't going to be competing in any contests. As I sold my business, I had loads of free time. So I was helping my friends who ran these large music festivals. I was involved on campus in uh, Israeli advocacy. Well, I'd never really been to yeshiva or had done any Jewish learning whatsoever. So I thought it would be an interesting place to learn about Jewish philosophy and Jewish spirituality. I came to HP because I was, I was looking for answers, honestly. Aish for me provides an amazing diversity and balance. And it gives me an opportunity really to reach out to people that were like myself, that were coming from background of, of, of very little understanding. Coming to uh, Aish, didn't know how to read Olive Base. Since then, I've had the opportunity to, to progress and grow and fully versed now in not only uh, Hebrew and Olive Base, but learning, you know, Gomorrah. Every person, every student that walks into Eish Torah, we're trying to educate them and inspire them to really want to and be able to make a difference for the Jewish people. It's a place where there's a community of people who care about you. Every single rabbi that I know here wants the best for me, tries their best, so they're a good example. There's so many different options, so many classes, programs, seminars, ideas, levels, different types of teachers, different personalities, different options beyond just the curriculum, activities to get involved in. And Asia is the perfect place for that because it's just a wild variety of all the different kinds of people and programs and things that we do around here. It's everything, everything that's important in life. You, you want to learn, you want to be connected, you want to live a Jewish life. This is where you learn how to do it in, in happiness and the right way. At the center of Eishat Torah is our base medrash, a place which is electric, students engaged in understanding the depths of Torah and understanding how to become better people, how to grow, and how to give over to other people. So learning in Eishat Torah next to the Temple Mount every single day is amazing. Why? Because whenever we open up the Torah, the Gemara, we're learning about things that happened right here. When I 
look out the window and I look at the hotel and I'm able to dive in there and our forefathers like prayed and just you know steps away and now I have the opportunity to be here and to learn in that same place. I don't know. It's kind of beyond words. I, I can just feel so fortunate that I'm that I'm able to do that. It's taught me so much about life, and oh, it, it's taught me a whole new way to live. It's really much, much bigger than a yeshiva. Eishat Torah is really an organization that believes in the importance of the Jewish people. And it does that by empowering individuals to make a, make a difference in the world. And to me, that's very, very special. Hello, everyone. My name is David Rossman. And when I think about the Eish Yeshiva, I think of it as a microcosm of the Jewish people people from all walks of life, different backgrounds, different age groups, from all over the world. They all come to one place, to one center, one common purpose. That's to connect through the history, the rich history, and the rich future of the Jewish people. The awesome classes that we all experienced this over this weekend, just a fraction, just a little taste of what's offered over there in the yeshiva. And I'd like to personally invite everyone here, please come, no matter how old you are, where you're from, come for a class, two classes, a few weeks, a few months, to be able to experience our yeshiva. We have custom-made, custom-tailored programs just for you, and I hope to be able to greet you on the other side of the ocean and to be able to learn and grow together with you. Rabbi Berg mentioned over the weekend that Eisha Torah has been successful in opening up many branches around the world, and you've met them over this weekend as well. However, in just a few short years, two years in fact, Eisha Torah opened three new branches around the world. Recently, in the Thornhill Woods Shul, located in northern Toronto, they were looking for... They were looking for a rabbi that can engage the thousands of less affiliated, less connected Jews in the area. And they reached out to Rabbi Elisha and Rabbi Sinfredi Mandel. They took charge of that and are accomplishing amazing things up there in Thornhill Woods. Now, I have no idea what that is, but I'm sure, I'm sure one day I'll make it there. Certainly Rabbi Berg has been there. But yashakoch to you. Thank you, the Mandels and the Thornhill Woods community that's here. I joked Friday night that there was a simultaneous translation in Spanish going on here for all the Spanish-speaking uh, members of the Aish family around the world. In fact, the waiters commented to me that it was a pleasure dealing with them. Under the leadership of Rabbi Mayor Rosenberg from the, his office in Jerusalem, he was able to direct the Latin American branches around the world, such as Chile, Mexico, Argentina, and San Diego, these Latin American branches. And you ask why San Diego is a Latin American branch, and I'll leave that for our dear Rabbi Mayor Rosenberg to explain that and to tell you about all the amazing things going on in the H. Atora Latin American branches. Rabbi Rosenberg. Good evening to everybody. Buenas noches. Bienvenidos. Three years ago, I was working in West Jerusalem, and I was the director of the outreach department. That means I was directing all the key of activities that we have in the new building, Veshatora. Essentials, discovery, the seminars, the classes. 
And one day I have a meeting with Robbie Berg in his office, and we were speaking about all the summer programs that we were going to have that year. At the end of the meeting, I told him, Roy Berg, there is one more thing I want to talk to you about. And I said, as you know, I'm from Latin America. I was born in Costa Rica. I grew up in Chile. I lived in Mexico. I think I know Latin America very well. There is one thing I really know about Latin America, and that is that the people in the communities are really, really struggling to survive. People are not attending to the communities, and the people are assimilating. I told Roy Berg, we currently have two branches in Latin America. We have a branch in Santiago de Chile, which is an amazing branch. They have hundreds of people coming every week for classes, learning, to Shabbat. They send people to Israel on trips, students, adults. They have seven full-time rabbis working in that branch, and another few part-time rabbis working in that branch. And they have two shuls, one Sephardi, one Ashkenazi. It's an amazing community. It's a vibrant community that they build there. And we also have a very successful branch in Mexico City, which also has hundreds of people coming to learn every week. They send missions to Israel. They send a mission to Israel every six months. They send a mission to Israel. They're making a huge impact in the, in the city, not only in the secular community, also in the firm community. It's an amazing branch. And I told Robert all of this is really amazing, but we have to do more. At that moment, I gave him a document that I wrote, with some ideas that I have, what we could be doing more in Latin America. And after he read it, he looked at me and he says, Mayor, we have to make this happen. Even if you have to leave everything you're doing, I want to focus on this and make this happen. And Baruch Hashem, since there, 18 months after, we already have opened two new branches for AIDS in Latin America. We opened a branch in San Diego, California, which is Latin America. Why? It's because there's a very big Mexican community. Jews from Mexico went in the past 15 years to live in San Diego, hundreds of families. And they contacted us, and they said, we want to open an age branch here. And when I asked them why, they told me, we have everything we want here in San Diego. It's a beautiful place. It's one thing missing. We don't have spirituality. And we want an Ish branch to come here and feed our souls. That's where we open a branch for them in San Diego, California. <laughs> we also open a branch in Buenos Aires, Argentina, which is, Buenos Aires has the biggest Jewish Latin American community in the world. 200,000 Jews live there. And just to give you an idea, in the neighborhood where we open the branch, it's called Belgrano, there are 50,000 Jews living there. And almost all of them are secular and not connected to Judaism. And we open a branch for them to bring them back and to reconnect them to Judaism. <laughs> but the truth is, that's only the beginning. We're already working in opening two more branches in different cities. And we're also expanding our branch in Mexico City. We're opening a second center in a different neighborhood to be able to impact even more people. Once I told Roy Berg, I ask him, what's the goal for what I'm doing? You asked me to open branches in Latin America. What's your vision? What do you want to accomplish? And Roy Berg looked at me and said, Mayor, it's very simple. Our goal is we're going to open an age branch on every Latin American city when there are Jews living there. That's our goal. I'm going to make that happen. <laughs> so I But of course, Everything we're trying to do will not be possible. We didn't have the right rabbis who are the center of the branches and who are willing to leave their cities or their countries to move to new places and open new branches for age. And that is why tonight we want to give a recognition to the new age rabbis who opened these new branches because of their hard work, their commitment, their passion for age and for the Jewish people. And I want to call to come to the stage to the new age rabbis Rabbi Niso and Rabbi Zinyafa Palti from Esh San Diego, and Rabbi Marcelo and Rabbi Zin Marjorie Malnik from Esh Buenos Aires. Please come to the stage. Okay, so uh, very briefly, 
First of all, you know that San Diego used to be Mexico, right? <laughs> in any case, I do have to make a confession. Before I uh, was offered the job in uh, San Diego, and uh, they said it's a Shatora, and I had a loose relationship with the Shatora for like over 20 years. And I know all the good work that I did, but I was thinking, you know, maybe we don't need it. We can just set up a place and uh, call it something brilliant and creative. Yes, huh? How do we call it? I wanted to call it the Hokey Pokey, the place where you turn yourself around. <laughs> Wouldn't that have been better? <laughs> so the truth is that sometimes you see it from far, and when you come near to something, you get disappointed. Here was the opposite. As we came close to Eshatora, going to Jerusalem, and then meeting my colleagues in all the branches, etc., we realized their warmth, their passion, their authenticity. This is really the best organization in the world. We're so thankful for Eshatora. Thank you. Now invite Rabbi Marcelo and Ruth Marjorie Melnick, please, from Ace Buenos Aires. Thanks, everyone. We're very excited being here. When we were offered the job in Buenos Aires, and of course, many of you have little idea about Argentina, but let me explain you a little bit. Argentina is a country famous for having probably the best football players. It's famous also for having good meat. Okay, from Steve Berg, when he came down to Argentina, said, there's one thing I must do before I go back. Okay, we, do, we didn't go once, went twice to have meat. Okay, and we had a great time together. And also Argentina is famous for having the Pope. The current pope is Argentina. But Argentina was not famous for having a Shatora. And as uh, Ramey said, there's 200,000 Jews out there that really did not have anything close to what the Shatora is offering. And uh, it, was really, it was really sad. We were offered the job, and we were very happy having, uh, living our lives in Santiago, Chile. We come from Chile. And uh, it was very very hard for us to make the decision to move to a different country. And then I remembered that, as uh, somebody said yesterday, I was also part of the fellows that walked into Rabbi Noah's office, uh, okay, asking for some advice, okay, and walked out, okay, with a mission. And he told me clearly that I should be working for the Jewish people. And uh, I need to th say thank you to everybody here. There's many Rebbeim here. We are an age product. We've been related to Aish for 20 years. And I have to say thank you to each and every rabbi and uh, rabbitson that uh, went through our lives. It was very special for us, and uh, especially to Rav Noach Zatzal, that he really inspired us to do this. And as I've been saying over and over and again, all the people that were touched by Aish Torah, we're very thankful to Aish, right? But the way to thank Aish is not just talking, like I'm doing here, the, really the way to thank whatever we've got from age is to give back. Okay? Whatever we receive from Asha Torah, our obligation is really to go back and to return that to other Jews that are out there. We're very happy and pleased and excited to open the branch in Buenos Aires. We hope to have you there. We're going to give you good meat. We can take you to a football game, okay? and we hope to be able to bring you here inside our community and to enjoy with you the impact we, Mer Hashem, will cause in many, many Jews. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now in English.
One of the things Eish Torah is known for around the world is cutting-edge ways of teaching our material to students and people around, Jews around the world. Eish.com deserves a mention here, doesn't it? But just, but just being able to taste this tonight, we've had more PowerPoint presentations at this Eish conference tonight than at all other conventions combined. Just the way of giving over material to Jewish students around the world has been cutting edge throughout the years. And that's what Rav Noach encouraged his students, and that's what the leadership of Eish Torah continues to encourage its branches and its teachers to continuously find new and better ways to teach the students around the world. On that note, Rabbi Arturo Kanner, who was mentioned before, was director of Aish Mexico, has put something together and has taught his community using a brand new uh, presentation and app. I'd like to ask Rabbi Arturo Kanner to give you a little taste of Aish innovation around the world. Good evening, everyone. I want to really share a secret, a very big gift. I was blessed to have for clarity to give Torah over before Trump builds the wall. <clears throat> Two years ago, I was in the big climax of, let's say, my Mexican Kiruv career. I was, thank God, teaching over 300, 400 people a week, very popular in the religious community. We had like a very clear program, of Project Inspire, over 150 people every week. We're doing a lot of great work. But I went into a very big crisis. It seemed that for about two, three months, I knew something in my heart was not doing well. I really was very surprised because honestly, everything was great. You'd ask any of my rabbeim, you'd ask any of my friends, they would say, you have the dream job, you're being successful, you're being happy, you're being, doing a great job. What's happening? So I used to fight this sense of emptiness. To one point I say to myself, you know what? You have to embrace it. Embrace the pain, embrace the loss, embrace the emptiness, and just see what it's saying to you. One of my rabbis always told me, a crisis is your neshama telling you you have to make an upgrade. So I embraced the crisis. And that made me, really make me the following three questions. First question, I thought to myself, it's very hard that every time you see people saying, the most important thing is, you know, Avas Hashem. You have to be close to Hashem. You have to do mitzvahs with Hashem. Other people will tell you, no, 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 one second. For sure that's true, but you know, the after Kamocha, Losisna, the base of Mitzvah was destroyed because of how do you relate to others. Then you come to the famous Vilna Gaon. If you really don't change your midot, your midas, so what are you here for? So it's very confusing. So I said to myself, Arturo, how can you conceptualize Judaism in a way that is growth, simple, that you can relate to it? I'm a therapist in profession. I know how to know who's a good therapist. I know how to conceptualize a good therapy session. Do I know how to really conceptualize Judaism in a clear way? Second of all, you know, Judaism has great ideas, very impactful ideas. But I used to feel I was a spiritual entertainer. I spoke to Rev. Lawrence Kellerman, and he told me, you know what, Arturo, I'm already tired to be a spiritual entertainer. I really wanted the real thing. And I felt that was happening to me. I wanted to make my spiritual Netflix. You know, people want to know what's the new cutting edge spiritual idea. So that was my crisis. But third of all is, if someone would have told me, Rabbi Kanner, okay, I'm willing to receive all the Judaism you want to give me. How would you like to see me? So my crisis was that, yeah, you were doing great. But like, really, what's the goal of everything? In a clear, conceptual way, we can all grow. So that was my crisis. And the answer to the crisis was the basic thing. It's in Spanish. But we developed the following thing. What's the whole concept of Yiddishkeit, of Judaism? It's what I call the GPS. G stands for God. For sure, we need a relationship with God. Like the Nesiva Shalom, based on the Kabbalah and the Zohar says, Every mitzvah is an itin, an advice to connect to Hashem. But you know what? P, it's people. 
We need to be connected to other people. Whoever is a Talmud of Rabberku is like I am. We learn so much of mitzvot benam lechavero, so much of what's gneva dat, how to be into, like a, a real person, truthful person, how to not have in, in your heart sina. There's so many mitzvot benam lechavero. There's one last thing also, self. Self means we have a goof and a neshama. To which extent our neshama, our intellect, is able to rule over our goof? Kedoshim tiu is the basis of all Judaism. So I realized, one second, I have already a model. And basically, what's the source of all this? It's not myself. It's the Mishnah in Pirkei Avol, where it says, Shimon HaTzadik Kaya Omer, Al Shlosh HaDraim HaOlam Omer, Al Torah, Avodak, Milud HaSadim. You have to see the maral there, explains what I'm saying. The three relationships in the world we have, and we have to be a perfect human being in each one of them, is with Hashem, with people, and with ourselves. So I said to myself, that's wonderful. And GPS means, GPS means basically choice. So then I said to myself, okay, what's the model of really teaching? So then like Rav Goldstein said, we have to be authentic. Authentic means we really have to give Torah like it is. But then like we're in a spiritual holocaust, CPR. What's CPR? It has to be clear for our minds, relevant for our emotions and practical to our goof. It's a CPR of authenticity. So I said, that's wonderful. So I did my 50 courses on transformation, which if I could dream to really have courses on God, on people, on self, each one is four classes, then this is a perfect human being, seemingly. It's, it's in blue because it's like the, the sky. It's in red because it's love for people. And self is green because it's growth. So then, okay, that was the first step. What's the second step? What's the pathway to grow? How do people grow? So I read a lot of things. I remember I read a lot of what's I read a lot of books at Harvard about education. So I realized these are the five steps. First, you have to have a desire. You have to want it. You have to be responsible. After that, you have to be very, very knowledgeable. You have to be aware and you have to act upon. So with all that clarity, I said, what am I going to do? So this is where we come to the final thing, the age app. It's an age app in Mexico where I tried to answer all this question, all this creativity, and give voice to my crisis. So what did it mean? The first thing, there's the 50 GPS courses that basically each month we put some of them. People have to inscribe, subscribe themselves. They have to pay. And they come to the classes, not virtual. They come. It's four classes. And they have to really work on it. Not only that, we have the spiritual diet. Every week I send a video on the Parsha with either G, P, or S. It's clear what it is. And we encourage people to really have a GPS standpoint of view. After that, that, that's the basic thing, we give challenges. Every single class you come, like a WhatsApp, you get the challenge of the class. You have to write it down. You have to grade yourself, and you're constantly growing. In the speech, spiritual diet also, after the Parsha, there's an action. For example, what it says here in Spanish, this Parsha was in Haye Sarah, which says, all the days of Sarah were good. So we all know what has been good. He, she used his, the, her time for growth. So what is the challenge? In this day, see your life, what aspect of the day can you choose to make in the right way and make a spiritual impact? So that's the way that people start growing. And finally, then you have like your real record. You know your journey. You can see in percentage to which extent you're growing. So it's like a real diet. You see that life is a journey and Judaism is a journey. What's the impact that it's having? I'll tell you the truth. I have a very close doctor to me. And he says to me, you know what? I love the GPS because I stand in the morning, I put feet and say, okay, there's G. Then I go to my office, I'm curing a person, that's P. And then there's a nutnik who's really bothering me, and I work on my patient by herself. He's giving me a whole lesson of Judaism. I have a student who was completely secular. He'll tell the other friends, you know what? I love the fact that this is GPS. It gives me a sense of context, of meaning. I want to finish, this time is over. Because Rabbi Zelman told me, okay, but where the GPS gets you to? And I'll tell you the truth. It gets you to be a light unto the nations. Because if a person really is completely, completely connected to his creator in a sense that he feels it. If a person is really harmonious to other people and a person is worked as a mensch and in his midas, then you're a real light. So I want to finish with a story. I finish every year in Neila, in Aish, Mexico. That what's the essence of a Jew? There's a lady who was in Borough Park uh, buying clothes for her, her kids before Yom Tev. So there's a poor kid, a very poor kid in the window, seeing how the mother would buy his kids clothing. So the, 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 the lady saw the kid and said, please, come in, come in, buy whatever you want. So then the kid saw her and said, excuse me, are you God? Then she answered, no, I'm one of his children. So the kid said, I knew you were family.
So that's the essence of a Jew, that's the essence of GPS, that's the essence of making innovation, and I hope you all of you can encourage and live this way. We shall be a light into the nation. Thank you very much. I feel like if I didn't stand up here and thank the chief rabbis, Rabbi Lau and Rabbi Lau and Rabbi Goldstein, then I'd be out of place. Truth of the matter is, so many of you have come over to me and told me that it's not only such an honor to have Rabbi, Rabbi Lau here, Rabbi Stromayer Lau here with us, but it's also such a pleasure to have him here, to speak to him, to get to sit down at Kiddush with him and to talk. Rabbi Lau told me he hasn't worked this hard and that I take in a long time, and that I, I take my traits after Paro, who continued to work the people harder and harder. That's true. He also told me, when he called me this week, that when I met him in his office in Tel Aviv, I told him he's speaking twice. Now he sees on the schedule that he's speaking five times, and there's still a few days left to the conference, so what's up my sleeve? So Rabbi Lau, this is the final one. But on behalf of all the Rabbeim, the branch heads around the world, it's really my honor again to introduce to you the Chief Rabbi of Tel Aviv, the former Chief Rabbi of Israel, Rav Yisrael Meir Lau Shlita. Can't see anyone, but in the dark and in the night. I want to explain you through the word of the sages. This week, parasha, this morning, the important need of Asia Torah. How can we find it this week, parasha? Told us. Asaph hated. Father Jacob. He took my priority. Now he took blessings from my father. The days of mourning after the passing away of my father, the Aharga et Yaakov Then I shall kill my brother Jacob. Not today. Not tomorrow. After the passing away in the seven days of mourning, our father. Why is he waiting? He must be very angry. Why didn't he kill Yaakov immediately? On the spot. Rashi, this is the truth. The real Torah, the truth of Torah is that Esau, how evil he was, but to give respect to your father, he was a model that we can learn from him, Kibud Av. Used to bring meat to his father. Now he says, I will wait and killing my brother till my father passed away. I want to avoid to prevent frustration. My father will be frustrated. Sad to me. One son killed his brother, other son. I want to prevent my father this it's bitterness. I shall wait till my father will die. Nice. Right away. Murderer, sentiments. Sentiments for his father. But Rashi says, there are some words of the sages. You see at them what another explanation to the behavior of Esau. One of them I want to bring you. Esau was very calculated, very sophisticated. He was a murderer with a brain. He said, 
how stupid was Cain. Cain killed his own brother Hevel because he wanted the whole world in his arms. To divide the world between the two brothers was for him not enough. He wanted the whole world. So he killed Hevel. No talk, no dialogue, no discussion, nothing. He killed it to get rid of a conqueror, a competition. How stupid he was, said Asa. He didn't take in consideration that after killing his brother Hevel, his father, Adam, will have another child. What happened? Adam and Eve were together. Vayoledet a third son. Shatli Elohim He will be a substitute to Hevel ki harago Kain. Hevel was killed by Kain. Kain is a murderer. You cannot change the, the situation, but will not inherit not the world and not half of it was expelled. So you didn't earn anything, says Asaph about Cain. Killed your brother. You wanted to get rid of a competition. And what did you receive? Another brother. You are a killer with no results, no profit. I am not as stupid as a Cain was. I shall wait till my father will die. After passing away of my father, I know that I have a bill only with one person, Jacob. Another competition will never be born if my father died. I will kill Jacob after passing away of father Yitzchak, knowing that no competition. I will be alone with my brother. Take revenge. Sophisticated. In the chain of murderers, after Cain and Esau, there is a number three. Paro, king of Egypt, at that time. Paro said, how stupid was Esau. He was waiting to kill his brother till his father will die. And he didn't take in consideration that in the meantime, Jacob, his brother, will have 12 sons and his daughter, Dina. This is the final solution? This is the way to get rid of a competition? He wanted to get rid of Jacob. Now Jacob has Reuben and Shimon and Levi and Judah and all the others. We'll never finish with them. I am not stupid as Esau was. I will not give them a chance to build families. I will not give them a chance to live, to exist, to survive. He called to the two ladies, Shifra and Pua, when you help the Jewish ladies to give birth, make a selection a Mengele selection. Final solution, if there is a boy, you kill him immediately. Don't enable him to marry, to build a family. Kill him on the spot. They didn't obey, they refused. So he said, He gave a command, a rule for all the nations. Look at the Jewish family. Kol habena yilod. Every boy who is just now born, hayeora tashlichu. Send him into the Nile, into the river. We have three murderers. Everyone thinks that he's cleverer than the other. Cain, Esav, Pharaoh. 
Then came another man, a figure everyone knows, Haman. Haman said how stupid was Pearl. It's a competition who is a better killer. Look at this race. Takes the golden medal of murder. How stupid was Pearl. He made a rule against the boys called Haben Hayilo, the Jewish boys. He didn't know the Jewish law. According to the Jewish law, children go after the mother. The daughters who are born in Egypt will exist, will survive. Even if they will marry some Egyptian, the children will be Jewish. When the wedding is not according to the Jewish law, the mother gives the two. So we will never finish with it. Is this a kind of a final solution? I am clever. I will not make the same mistake that Pero made. Bikesh le Hashmid wanted to liquidate, le Harod to kill, ulabe to lose, at Kola Yudi, all the Jews, Minar, the Azaken, tough babies, the Nashim, and ladies, women, in one day, 13 of Adar. See, who is clever? Murders. The competition is not who is better, who is cleverer, who is more a scholar a philosopher, whatever, who kills more with brain. And then the end of the sages is that in future, they said it 2,000 years ago, in future, Midrash Rabbah, in future, they will come Gog, Umagog, maybe we had it already. 75 years ago in Europe, Gogo Magog. Gogo Magog will say they have another theory. Fool were all those killers. Cain and Aesop, Pero and Haman. They made all kinds of programs how to liquidate the Jewish people. And they forgot that the Jewish people have a father in heaven. He will beat them, he will punish them, he will bring them sufferings, but he will never let to liquidate his nation. He will defend them. He will give them an umbrella. For him, they are immortal. We, Gogoma Gogoma, we have another theory, another way how to get rid of the Jews. We have to disconnect them from their father in heaven. Look at the second chapter of the Psalms. Let's disconnect the Jews from God. If they are loyal to him, if they trust him, if they follow his commandments, he will never neglect them. He will never let them to be liquidated. At that moment that they will show him the back, no Shabbat, no Yontev, no Kashrut, no Mikveh, no Bet Knesset, no Talis, no Tfil. At that moment they are in our hands. We can do what we want. If they are connected to him, we'll fail. If they will be disconnected from him, we can do what we want. This will be the final solution. Gog Umagog. Tehillim, Psalms chapter 2. This is the look of the sages 2,000 years ago about the chain of murderers. I think that 
75 years ago was exactly like, like Gogo Magoga. They trust, they test both ways. On one hand, they said, Lechu Venachi Demigoi, yes, Chambers, Auschwitz Birkenau, Majdanek, Treblinka, Belzitz, Sobivor, Chlemno, Lechu Venachi Demigoi. This is the final solution of Wannsee Conference, January 1942. But there is a continuity in the same sentence. The sound. Velo Yizacher Shem Yisrael Od. The name Israel will be never mentioned in it. We will bring to a situation of liquidation of the name Israel, Jewishness. Not only a physically Holocaust, a spiritual one. Let's liquidate them physically. Yes, Chamber, and other kinds. Velo Yizacher Shem Yisrael Od. This is a spiritual fight. No more Jews. No more Jewishness. They declared a war, the Nazis, not only against the Jews, but also against Judaism. Exactly what Magog wanted, they did it, the Nazis. Now we see how they failed and how lucky we are after 75 two years. As I mentioned before occasionally this evening, for example, in Israel, at that time when World War II ended, we were about half a million Jews in the land of Israel. 72 years after, we are almost 8 million. This is physics. You build a state, homeless, look at it. And the center of Torah, which is in Israel today, never existed since Hizkiyahu, king of Judea, in the times of the first temple. Never. Hillel and Shammai, Rabbi Akiva and Rabbi Shmael, none of them had the privilege to see so many yeshivot and so many Torah, and so many yeshiva boys in their eyes, what we can face today. From Kiryat Shmona in the north, till Eilat in the south, you will not find one city in Israel without a yeshiva. Not only a religious school with Jewish studies, yeshiva. And here comes the function of Eisha Torah. What is the word Eish? I knew Rabbi Noah Weinberg, Zechat Tzadik Levraka. Why did he choose this word, this expression, Eishat Torah? Torah, Torah Temet, Torah Shlema, Keter Torah, Talmud Torah. No, Eishat Torah, by Eish. And you see here only the word Eish, Eish, whatever you want. And you see the flame. There was one prophet among the 12 last prophets in the Bible. One prophet who gave us, left us, only one chapter of prophecy. Ovadia. Ovadia, one chapter. We will read it in the Haftorah in two weeks from now. Vayishlach. Shabbat Vayishlach, we read the Haftorah of Ovadia. And he compares the Jewish people in future, in our time. For him it was future, for us it's present. What is it? The Haya Beit Yaakov Esh. The people of Jacob, Bnei Israel, Beit Yaakov, will be, they are compared to a fire. 
ובית יוסף, יוסף פמילי, מנשה אין אפרים, להבה, להבה, פליים. פייר, פליים. This is the prophecy of Prophet. Why fire? Fire is something dangerous. We escape from fire. When we make a flame in Lag Baomer, we take care that the children will be far, far away. It's dangerous. It threatens. So why is the comparison of the Jewish people, according to the prophet, fire and flames? Because fire has three positive things. Number one, light. There was no electricity in the time of Avadia. When you wanted to expel the darkness, you put a fire. You took two stones and made create fire. Fire gave light. Fire gave warmth. Not to freeze. Not to die of easy. Warmth. And fire is another thing. The third plus of fire is togetherness. You cannot feed a fire with no partnership. A match, paper, cartoon, a piece of wood, and another piece, and another piece, gazer ets, bull ets, trees ets. In Hebrew there are many expressions, pieces of wood, of all together, never fire. You cannot make, even in Lag Baomer, one flame, one piece of fire. You need a combination of many things. And a little bit of gasoline, spirit, alcohol, whatever you use to create the fire and to keep the fire burning, giving the light and the warmth. So the prophet says, the Haya, a day will come, future, Beit Yaakov, the family of Jacob, all the 12 tribes will be ash. We create light and warmth and friendship and brotherhood and togetherness if we want to survive. And who doesn't? Mi ha'ishe chafetz chayim. Everyone desires life. Life means physically and spiritually. Against those Gogu Magog who wanted to destroy both the body and the soul. Against them, we need to be like the flame of Avadia the prophet, giving light for all the world, including San Diego in California, near Mexico, and Costa Rica, and even Buenos Aires, and Rosario in Cordova. Bring fire, bring light. Bring warmth, not loneliness, but togetherness. Maybe this was in the mind of Rav Noach Weinberg Zetzal when he called this movement. It's not just an organization, it's a movement. Esh HaTorah, from now and ever. <laughs> Rabbi Lau. You know, Rabbi Lau, it's hard to look at you and your Rebbitzin and your family and not to think of the famous passage that we say that in the Haggadah at the Pesach Seder, at the Seder table. With our children gathered around the table, we remind them and we remind ourselves that in every generation, Nations and sometimes the entire world stand up against us both physically 
and spiritually, but Hashem saves us time and again. He has and will save us both physically and spiritually. <clears throat> All right, allow, allow us to pay tribute not only to you and your family that joined us this Shabbos, but to the 39 generations of Rabbanim, of rabbis, unbroken chain of rabbis in your family that have led and continue to lead the Jewish people.
<laughs> Thank you, AK Pella. How many of you in the room are from J Inspire and Project Inspire? <laughs> Under the leadership of Rabbi Chaim Sampson and Rabbi Simcha Barnett, the J Inspire has been growing exponentially, not only across the tri-state area, and not only across North America, but even Toronto, which, which some might think is part of North America. But anyway, if Mexico, if Mexico is in the United States, then Toronto can be outside, you know. But anyways, uh, Jane Spire has grown in Toronto, and the Jane Spire is based on the model, as you heard over Shabbos, you heard Friday night as well, of mutual inspiration, Jews of ba different backgrounds, from religious backgrounds, from non-religious backgrounds, coming together on trips, on learning programs. And that, that J Inspire model has spread to Toronto, where Rabbi Tzvi Sittner, who's a rabbi at the Village Shul in Toronto, I know so many of you here from his shul, from his shul as well, Rabbi Sittner, thank you for your speech at the end of Shabbos, has taken this model and incorporated it into his branch in Toronto as well. Ladies and gentlemen, the J Inspire and J Inspire Toronto. I think it's impossible. Any rabbi who says that they can successfully help a community grow, even if you have a larger staff following up with so many people, impossible. One of the things that I learned from Isha Torah was that it's not enough to simply have the professional, the paid person doing outreach, but the idea is to inspire the community to do outreach. As talented as some of our rabbis are and their impact, they partnered with the Frim community, took them in as their partners. Their impact can be so much enhanced by that. We have these Israel trips. We have over 100 people a year from Toronto are going to Israel. And we have lay people as city leaders, as those people who are mentoring the broader community. I can honestly say that I learned more from being on that trip with people who were seeing Yiddishkeit for the first time. Seeing people starting and listening and learning and smiling as they were learning and like, oh my gosh, that makes sense. And being part of it, being part of while they were learning was, was I think for me, so, was so amazing. I'm on a JDRP trip and I meet Ami Frankel. We start talking about, so what's gonna be the next level? What's next? And that's when, you know, we come up with this idea, Torah 2.0. We said, our goal is going to be each of us to get 10 guys. I'll try to get 10 guys from my community. He's gonna to try to get 10 guys from his shul, the View Mount Shul. And together, we'll partner up these 10 and 10 to make the initial 20, you know, guys who are going to be in Torah 2.0. And that's, that's how it started. We started a Chavrusa program in conjunction with Asia Torah. Most of the guys from the three different trips come together, and I've reached out to people within the Orthodox community to get them to come be chavrusas. We're empowering Jews that are coming through our program, we're empowering the firm community. So working with Jay Inspire has been an amazing opportunity to expand that reach to achieve even more. Jay Inspire really does all the work for me. They send me the material that includes all of the Torah sources for the topic we're going to be discussing, relevant examples of how these concepts apply to people's life. I see growth from my peers and my friends that I brought in as the Chavrusa to learn with the secular, less affiliated. They love it, they tell their friends to come, and uh, we're starting a movement. It's affecting every portion of people's lives, their marriages, their children, their community, their shul, and we hope to just help it grow and expand to cover all parts of the city, and we can bridge the gap between all types of Jews of all types of backgrounds. I think it's an incredible thing that's happening here in Toronto. You have it here in Thornhill Woods. You have it in the village hall, in H. Thornhill. So you have it in so many different places that Jews of all backgrounds are coming together with a sense of unity and sharing the beauty of Yiddishkeit with each other and with others. It matches different parts of the community and puts them together. It inspires everyone. 
So this project has such a wonderful impact on the student, on the teacher, who become very close friends, and on the community as a whole. And I can't understand why every community wouldn't want to do this. It's not just about the learning, it's about relating to each other and realizing we can learn from each other and we can grow together. This is what unity is, when everybody can really just gain from each other. We have to work together. This is the only way we're going to create a unified group of strong Jewish women and men learning and growing and, and taking things upon our families. What we've seen here in Toronto is that if you involve the broader observant community, then we have an exponential opportunity to reach so many more people. And that's really the new wave of Kiruv. And that will be the way of outreach, I believe, in the future. Hi, my name is Rabbi Tzvi Sittner, and uh, I am uh, in Toronto in the Village Shul. I have to say that uh, working in Kiru, very often we define our organizations by how many people we have working for us. We look at our staff, we say, you know, we have two rabbis, three rabbis, five rabbitsons, whatever we have working in our organization. But what if we can totally redefine our entire staff, not by how many people are actually working for the organization, but by how many Jewish people live in our cities and are willing to take responsibility for their fellow Jews. Imagine being able to say, we have a thousand people on staff and you only have to pay like five of them. That's what's going on. In Toronto, we, we started, uh, I moved there about three and a half years ago, and when we first got there, we started, an organi we started a program called Scotch Steak and Study. And uh, it was phenomenal. As you can imagine, it grew very quickly. And uh, before I knew it, we, we had about 100 guys coming out to the program. And I turned to, to some of my staff and I said, how are we following up with this group of people? What are we going to do to ensure that their learning is continuing, that their growth is continuing? And I had a conversation with Stuart Heitman. And Stuart said to me, you've got to use the Frum community. You've got to use the Jewish people here who want to help. That's exactly what we did. As you saw in the video, we partnered up with uh, Ami Frankel, a bunch of people from the Viewmount Shul, which is a local shul right near us. And we started partnering up. The idea was 10 and 10, to have a group of 20 people. It started off as 10 and 10. It was 36, 50, 75. We have over 100 people now learning in the program. This is every two, three weeks. I personally have to say that it is so touching and heartwarming to know that as a rabbi investing day and night in this work, I have so many partners. There are so many people helping to bring the Jewish people together. The unity, that, that the power, the energy in the room, if you would see, you walk in that room, you see any, uh, any Wednesday night you come in and there's 100 guys learning, it's unbelievable. But it, it goes beyond that. The Shabbos invites, when I learn that, that people aren't coming to the program, not because, they can't, they, they, not because they're not learning together, but because they're actually getting together on their own time, all the time, to learn. That they're hosting each other for Shabbos. And then beyond the program, on Israel trips, where we start bringing people together, one trip after another trip. The inspiration's incredible. I have to say, wherever you are in the world, regardless of city, doesn't matter where you are, if you're not tapping into our from community, if you're not tapping into the Jewish people who have resources, we're missing out. Right here, we have an organization, J Inspire. And I don't work for J Inspire, but I can tell you the benefits. J Inspire, they will help you find the resources to be able to tap into your communities, the trips they offer, the Chavrusa programs, the learning programs, so on and so forth. Tremendous, tremendous resources. If you haven't already, Get in touch with Rabbi Chaim Samson. Get in touch with Rabbi Simcha Barnett. You will see that you'll be able to transform your community using this model. Thank you. When 
I first handed the initial program to Rabbi Berg to review for this Shabbos, he took out a pen and he made a bunch of X's throughout the schedule, which was very encouraging, as you can imagine. But then I realized that all the X's were on his name. And he said to me, Yasta, you have to understand one thing. This Aish conference has nothing to do with me. This is about the Aish rabbis who are working so hard every day to find another Jew to inspire. Everywhere that you put me in the schedule, put them in. I said, I said, Roy Berg, you, 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 can't, you can't go an entire Aish conference without your name on the schedule. He said, once. So here he is, our leader, our CEO of Aisha Torah, Rabbi Stephen Berg. Thank you so much, uh, Yossi. Uh, first of all, I just want to start by thanking Yossi and the staff of this convention. It's been amazing, I think, for all of us. Both in terms of uh, spirituality and, more importantly, in terms of the physical way you took care of us, in terms of the food, in terms of the lodging and everything. Thank you so much. I also want to thank, uh, we have many, many partners here. A lot of the lay leaders from many of the branches that are here in the room that do an incredible job day in and day out. I've met with so many of you around the world. I'd like to single out a couple of folks sitting here in the front. Um, Isaac and Edie Gross, who are here. Stuart and Andrea Heitman, she saw Stuart on the screen, Sandy Schiff from Denver, and Manette Lewis Mayberg, who are here today with us. Um, they really, literally are here day in and day out, and uh, I have spent an uh, enormous uh, amount of time within the last two years uh, with them, staying in their homes, uh, and they are really the heart and soul and the reason that we're able to, uh, to build Asia Tour. Uh, and I also want to thank all the, uh, the branch heads that are here, all the professionals from Asia Torah, from Jerusalem and the branches that are here. You really are um, my brothers and sisters around the world, and you make Aish very, very special. Thank you. I want to take a step back. We talk a lot about Rav Noah Weinberg, our founder. I'd like to talk for a moment about the original Noah, the Noah that built the ark in the Chumash, in the Bible. And we learn that his generation, when God decided to cast a flood upon the world, that the sins that they committed were against each other. They stole from each other, they killed each other. It was uh, really horrendous. As, as, as a result, God flooded the world and decided to start over with Noah and his family. But that wasn't the only issue that came up in that Torah portion. At the end of that Torah portion, it tells a story of the Tower of Babel, Migdal Bavel, that there were people that got together to build a great tower to attack God. And when you read the story, you find something very interesting. That that group of people had learned the lesson from the generation of the flood. And they had united, they had come together but it ended in disaster when they attacked God. And the question that we have to ask is, unity is always supposed to be such a great thing. All day long we talk about Achtu's unity coming together for the Jewish people. How could it have ended in such disaster? So this past summer, my wife runs a camp, Camp Dina for girls. A lot of times I catch up on my reading during that time. And I ordered a couple different books, and when we received the package, my son Ari, he took a look at what was inside, and he said that we are now on every NSA watch list in America. I actually confirmed that with a politician friend of mine. He, he said we probably were. And what I ordered was two books that I read. And I'll tell, explain why I ordered these two books. The first one was The Communist Manifesto by Karl Marx. People talk about it all the time, but very few, as I have learned, have, have read it. And the second one was a horrific book called Mein Kampf, which was the only book that Hitler wrote. And the reason I ordered these books and I wanted to read them was because these two books were responsible 
for the destruction of millions of lives. Literally millions of people around the globe and many, many Jews were physically killed and spiritually wiped out as a result of just two books. And when I read these books, although different in style, they were common in one way. They both were filled with hate. They built a movement that was all about hating people. And any time a movement is built on hate, it will ultimately be doomed, but it will take a lot of people along the way. And I realized that this is what was going on in Migdal Bavel at Tower of Babel. Yes, they were united, but they were united in a cause to go up against God. And it ultimately failed. And then onto the scene comes Abraham. Abraham understands what went wrong with the generation of the flood, how they attacked each other. He understands what happened with the Tower of Babel, how they came together to be destructive. And he decides that he is going to do things differently. And he starts the Jewish people built on a unifying force of love. People coming together to celebrate God. People coming together to do good things. And that was the basis for the Jewish people. We come together to be successful and to love each other and to grow and to build. And Abraham hands over this treasure, this ideology to his son Isaac. Isaac marries Rebekah, and they have twin children that we read about today in the Torah portion. They give birth to Jacob and to Esau. One very good son and one son who was extremely challenged and became very wicked. And as many of us are familiar with the story, Isaac seems to have a very soft spot in his heart for Esau, even though Esau is a terrible human being. And it gets to the point where Isaac is about to give the blessings of our tradition to Esau, seemingly the wrong son. And there's a complicated story where Rebecca realizes that Jacob should be the one to receive the tradition of Jewry. And they come up with a scheme to trick Isaac, who was blind at the time, to make sure that the right person, that Jacob, our forefather, that he gets the blessings. And the question arises, did Isaac not know who his sons were? Did he really not know who Jacob was and who Asaph was? What was going on? What was he trying to do? What was he trying to show? What was he trying to demonstrate? And I think that Isaac was trying to show Jacob two lessons. The first lesson was that when something is important, you must fight for it. To just receive the blessings because you're a good person, get the blessings, they, they just don't mean as much. But to see that you can almost lose those blessings, that tradition, that it's almost gone into the wrong hands and you have to rally and you have to fight. That's what the Jewish people are all about. We are here in this room because we have spent 2,000 years fighting in almost every country in the world. I tell you, I had one of the greatest experiences of my life a couple days ago, where uh, there's a website, the Middle East Monitor, with the article here. You could uh, Google it, just Google Steve Berg, horrible human being. And uh, Sukkot, we were in Israel and Yushalayim, and we have an app where you can see the Temple Mount, and it will show you what the temple looked like on that mount while showing you the rest in real time. And I tweeted out a picture and I wrote, one day soon. And they wrote a whole article about how I was advocating for the destruction of the Alaska Mosque. So I tweeted it out another 10 times. Because we're Jews and that's what we do. We fight. We fight for what's right. And Aisha Torah, which sits there, will be there.
forever. The second lesson that I believe that Isaac wanted to give Jacob, that Yitzhak gave Yaakov, the second lesson, was indeed Isaac was ready to give the blessings to Esau if only he had repented. If Esau had only given up that life of a murderer and a thief, if only he was able to turn himself around, yes, Isaac was ready to give him those blessings. Because as Jews, we believe every single Jew can come back. There is no such thing as a Jew not being able to rejoin our people. There is no such thing as a Jew not being able to come close to God. So even though Esau is a horrible human being, Isaac held out hope to the last second. And that was a lesson for Jacob. You must fight for what's right, and you must know that every Jew is precious. And we need to always hope and pray that they can come back to us. And I believe that this is what Asha Torah is all about. That as an organization or as a movement, as Rabbi Lau said, we will fight to the end for every single right that we deserve as Jews. And we also know that we will never leave a Jew behind. Doesn't matter where they are, is as beautifully as Rabbi Goldstein said today, even in Pakistan, we will seek them out and bring them into our community. When I started Asha Torah, I found a strategic plan. It was a gathering of many, many people from all around the world. And I read it, and it was very long, very detailed. But I basically found that our community of Asha Torah was looking for three things. They were looking for unity, functionality, and growth. And in my first email, the week before I started, I wrote that those would be my three goals two and a half years ago. Unity, I have spent so much time on the road visiting with all the branches. And over the years, especially since our Rebbe passed away, we all floated apart. And we have spent the last two and a half years of coming back together, whether it be in South Africa, Australia, England, Latin America, North America, Israel, we've once again come back together. And that's why we're so strong. Functionality, we have spent a lot of time making sure that we can do the things that we want to do. We went from having one event on a Friday night in our building in the Dan Family World Center. We could do seven or eight functions on a Friday night. Birthrights, JWRP, everyone is coming to us. We have taken the organization to a new level. But I want to talk for a moment tonight about growth. How are we going to grow our movement? How are we going to grow our organization? The first point I want to make is that we have a very simple goal in Asha Torah. Every single Jew in the world must have the ability to learn Torah, bar none. Every single Jew in the world must be given the opportunity to learn Torah. So we have one of the most beautiful yeshivas you heard from Rabbi Rossman. I'm proud to say that in two and a half years, our attendance was a little bit down the yeshiva under Rabbi Rossman's leadership and Rabbi Berkowitz's leadership. We now have tables out in the lobby. We don't know what we're going to do next year because we are so full. H.com, under the leadership of Nehemiah Coopersmith and Jack Calla, has done a great job of moving into online classes, increasing our social media, and getting Torah out there to the masses all around the world. All the branches, all of us have celebrated with JWRP, which has done such a terrific job of giving people their first experience to come to Israel. And I want to thank the Maybergs, who really started JWRP and did an amazing job at bringing thousands of Jews to visit Israel. And what we're going to do now is embark on what we call level two trips. We call it H Destiny, and Rabbi Jamie Callen is working hard. We're starting in May, June to make sure that Jews that have tasted Israel can now come back and spend significant time studying Torah in our building. 
Our rabbinical program, which we revitalized a year and a half ago, is on track to produce 15 rabbis a year. 15 rabbis a year that will go out around the globe and change the face of the Jewish nation. Women's learning has become a priority to us, and we recently brought on board Alana Cowlin, who's here with us, to make sure that women's learning programs are a priority for Asia Torah. And of course, as you saw, Rabbi Kanner, the GPS program, which is going to make learning Torah easier for all. The branches. For me, this is a very emotional topic because I view the men and women of the branches, the professionals, the leaders, the volunteers, they're the folks that are in the trenches. They are the people that every single day are out there reaching out to Jew after Jew after Jew after Jew. We will be there for all of you. Every branch, we will be there for you. We will be your home in Jerusalem. We will come to your home. There is nothing we won't do for you. Just as Mayor Rosenberg has taken over and built up Latin America, I can't tell you how many people have come to us from around the world and said that they want to join, they want more branches. You will see year after year after year more and more branches, more and more opportunities, more and more growth of Asia Torah, because we are a significant, important movement. But we are not a movement of Asia Torah, we are a movement of the Jewish people. This is Judaism. Asia Torah is that flame, is that fire to reach everyone around the world. And as we call this the Partners Conference, is because everyone in this room is our partner. And we talk about Project Inspire under Rabbi Samson's leadership, which has done great, great things in reaching out to Jews and telling them to reach out to Jews. I'm telling everyone in this room, it doesn't matter if you are fully orthodox, you're not orthodox, you think you're the greatest Jew in the world, or you think you're the worst Jew in the world. You have what to give. And you have to give it. Because for everybody in this room, there are thousands of Jews who don't know anything about their heritage. We have to find them, we have to connect, and we can't be embarrassed. We can't sit there, and so many people, I've had so many conversations this weekend where people said, this is great for me, but I don't know if I could bring my friends here. You have to bring your friends here. You have to bring your friends into your home. You have to bring your friends into the world of Torah. You have to go to the workplace and meet Jews and say, please, brother, sister, join me. Because that's what God wants from us. It's not complicated to be a Jew. It's about getting close to God. And he gave us the tool, and the tool is Torah. And we have to be there for our brothers and sisters around the world. I want to close with a story from this past week. I went to the dinner of the H Center, which is one of our branches that reaches out in Manhattan. They do a lot of executive learning with CEOs of big companies. And a fellow by the name of Jason got up and he talked about how he learns with his rabbi and he kept joking about the fact that he literally has no time, he's working around the clock. But he somehow made time to learn with this rabbi and he said that his wife has said that whenever he spends time learning that week, he's a better husband, which was moving. And I thought about when I heard this story and I want to tell you something about me personally which I don't think I've ever shared. I think most of you in this room are aware of my schedule, which takes me to uh, a lot of different places, a lot of phone calls around the clock. I think it would take me uh, a good six to nine months being in one time zone to kind of uh, get my body clock back on, uh, on one time zone. And when I uh, started to work for the OU, I moved to Manhattan. And I worked in downtown. And a friend of mine had worked in, uh, in finance. And we were close. And he sent me an email. I think it was 3.34 in the morning. And I called him the next day. I said, what, you know, 
What was up with that? He said, oh, we had a deal. It was closing, merger, or whatever it was. I said, so you were up 3, 3, 4 in the morning? He said, no, I was up later. Because when it's important, you put in the hours, you put in the work. And that's when I decided that if folks could do that in order to be successful in business, I could do that in order to serve God. And I want to close by telling all of you in this room that I know that you're thinking right now, I don't know if I can reach out to the people next to me. I don't know if I have time. I don't know if my friends will really buy into Judaism the way I do. And I'm telling you that there is a brotherhood in this room, there is a sisterhood in this room of Jews that care about God, Jews that care about each other. You can do it. And I'll take it a step further. We can't do it without you. I'd like to just give you all a blessing that you leave here, but before you leave, you take it upon yourself to figure out how you're going to reach out to your brothers and sisters. Because Asia Torah is only as strong as each and every one of you. Thank you. Rabbi Berg, thank you very much for your, for your word. People have been asking me here, it's so nice we've been seeing things from Latin America, North America. What about Israel? So maybe the best for last to show you some of the things that Rabbi Etiel Goldvich and Rabbi Shimi Kaufman have put together for Israelis and how to bring them closer. Unless you think that people in Israel automatically know more about their heritage just a little taste of the programs that Aish Israel, the Israel, the Israel branch of Asha Torah, the Israeli outreach branch of Asha Torah. Ladies and gentlemen, Aish Israel and Rabbi Etiel Goldberg. When I was younger, when I was in the military, before I was exposed to, to, to this world, I think Judaism and, and my service seemed like a very casual thing to do. Because everybody does it, it's so regular. I finished school, I do the military. I'm Jewish because that's what I was told when I was born. At first I thought it would be just fun and then go to parties in Tel Aviv, but they got really emotional at a certain point. It was like a dream, you know, why would anyone take me now to the U.S.? We met people, people of the U.S., people of the U.S. When I came to the U.S., all of a sudden, I was exposed to this huge community that cared so much about our existence. Eretz Israel didn't speak a word of English. When we moved to New York, we lived in a small apartment. I remember I have a brother that's a year and a half older than me. And being in the same room, I don't know if any of you ever shared a room with an older brother. It got uh, pretty tight at certain points. You know, we, we were the brothers, very competitive. And at a certain point, he like literally drew a line on the floor. And he's like, you stay on your side, I'm going to stay on my side. Don't get involved. I don't like this picture. We had this kasach between us. However, when I went to school, and being a little Israeli boy in an American school, it wasn't always so easy. If somebody started up with me, who was the first one to stand next to me and to protect me? It was my brother. You know, there's a certain sense of, uh, with family, sometimes when you're at home, there could be a strong fight between siblings. But if somebody attacks you from the outside, so then your brother comes and stands next to you. Eretz Yisrael is like our little room. It's our home. And sometimes in this little home, family members could fight. Maybe they draw lines and say, I want my room to look this way. I don't like the way the picture that you're posting on my room. This is my room. And it causes this fight between different Jews. However, we do feel in Israel also 
If there is chas v'shalom, a war, then there is that sense of unity. Everybody comes together. If a Jew is attacked in chutzlart, also there's that sense of unity. Then people don't feel separated. Oh, well, it doesn't matter what you vote for. But at the end of the day, my parents weren't looking for my brother to help me when I was in trouble in school. What did they want from us? They want us to get along even in the same house. And that's a little bit what we try to do at Aish Israel. You know, because I think the fact that we're part of this international movement, as you've seen this entire weekend, it gives us the opportunity to show the Israeli society that we are a family. And we're a family that needs to unite, not just when we get attacked from outside, but to get, unite in times of joy. And all of our programs, whether it's the program that you saw right now, which is soldiers coming to New York to follow up with birthright students, it in, we empower Israelis, even though they're not that deeply connected to Judaism, but they still have it. They grew up in Israel. They know about the holidays. They know what it means to be Jewish. We empower them to teach American Jews about Judaism, and then it enhances their connection. We bring Israeli women to be partners with the JWRP so that they could empower American women who come on trips to Israel. All of our programs, we brought over 100,000 Israelis to our programs in our buildings, and it's a great opportunity for us and a big schus, I believe, for myself and for my partner, Shimmy Kaufman, to really try to bring that sense of family to the Jewish people in Israel, to continue Rav Noach's legacy of creating a shift in the Israeli mindset of what Judaism really is and what the Jewish people are really all about. It's a big schus for me to be a part of this. And thank you, thank you, Aisha Tor, for giving me this opportunity. May we be zochet to soon see in our time the unity of Am Yisrael around Jewish values, around Torah. May it change in Eretz Yisrael and change all, around, all across the world. Thank you. to be able to continue this amazing movement around the world. Shavua Tov to all of you. Thank you. Na, 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 na.
Jerusalem, Jerusalem, city of my dreams. I've been this way some time before, at least that's how it seems. I walked your streets and I've seen your wall, and you know I've sung your song. Been waiting for that David man to come down and take us Hashem Elokai